When you see a doll, you see unbridled black excellence. Whether on the African continent, throughout the diaspora, or in your indigenous residence, it represents our unrivaled global presence. Whether prologue, present, or prescient, it's, it's a tribute to the days of the troubadours and chevaliers, to the griots heaven sent, that raised protest and said none rest until we put down local and global unrest to those who refuse to be reticent to those who refuse to be silenced it's it's a love letter to black love it's a warning to white violence it's years of tears it's eons of joy and a dollar you will see yourself your elders your peers men and women ladies and gentlemen children girls and boys it's a place you can explore digest and enjoy in a minute or a week in a year or an hour and what makes it unique is that it's complete and completely ours. It's a seed that blossomed and bloomed into a beautiful rainflower. It's an acorn buried beneath a radiant rain shower that grew into a tree. That voice you hear in your ear on the breeze says when you see a dawn, you see our unrivaled elegance, you see our undeniable presence. You see our joy, our pain, you see our, our struggle, our reign. When you see a dama, you see unbridled black ass. Man, my car doesn't talk. Okay, we just start asking questions. <laughs> I didn't know there were more intros. Okay, wonderful. Hi, everyone. Hi. Happy Sunday. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. I'm just going to start asking questions um, to our wonderful um, artist uh, today that's being interviewed, um, Masela Incolo. Is that how you say your last name? It's fine. I know it's going <laughs> to be difficult for you to pronounce that right, but Why it's fine. Say it? For us, one time. Masela Nkolo. Okay. Nkolo. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> now we've all heard it said properly. Um, so first, I want to start talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is memory. Um, with regard to memory and your sort of artist origin story, what are your first memories of art? Uh, when did you know that this is what you wanted to do? Were there important events or people in your life? that helped you discover that you are, in fact, an artist? Well, um, that's a long story. I'm going to try to be really specific and short. OK. So um, I discovered, first of all, art like all human beings, like a little boy. Uh, you know, I went to school, elementary school, uh, where we didn't have a uh, printer, you know, it's like uh, we used to use our books, um, but then sometimes because we didn't have a match of books, you know, like my school, we supposed to share, you know, with like my friends, stuff like that. And then I remember that day, the teacher had an idea to, to, to ask one of us to drawing like a, you know, black uh, blackboard. It, it was like that. Uh, 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 some of my friends, they, they told my teacher, so he can do it, you know, he's really good about it. And then it's going to be like that, all elementary, I mean, classes. You're drawing on the blackboard? I start to, to, do, to do it like on the board. And was this to help the teacher, like yes, with the instructions? Yes, it was help them a lot because, you know, living in Congo where, you know, people don't have access about everything, so it's, it's sometimes really hard for us to get like a books for all you know, mm -hmm. children or maybe 
a student. So uh, to describe all that things in the blackboard is really helpful for them to uh, teach us much better. So it was like that. I start to feel like, you know, uh, oh, I, I'm really good in that too, but I didn't have an idea about to, you know, to become an artist. I didn't know what it means to be an artist. So that took me like uh, years to understand that much better. Okay, so after uh, years of illustrating on the board to help your teachers mm -hmm. in elementary school, what, mm -hmm. what made you start to understand what an artist is and that that could actually be uh, a job? Well, um, I'm going to talk about one thing. My dad is, uh, he used to be a teacher too, uh, but he's a fruit. My dad is like a fruit, of, he, he was a fruit of uh, uh, colonialism time. So they sent him uh, like in Europe to go study. But they tell him, because my daddy had that dream to become like a doctor, you know, something like that. And then they told him, you cannot be a doctor. So you're going to be a good teacher. They made that decision for him to become someone he didn't want to be. You know, it was like that, my dad. But he was a really good teacher. And then you're going to be like that, my dad. Uh, he did decide in his life, when he was alive, like, like a, I don't want any of my children to do something by force. You know, I want to let them to be free to do what they want to do. So it's going to be like that when, uh, um, after finish like elementary school, I want to go to like a middle school. And then one day my dad looked at all this, my stuff I used to make, and the stuff I used to make. So my dad would tell me, do you want to be an artist? I say, what means an artist? You know, I used to like uh, uh, play with like lasers, uh, you know, do like a surgery, things like that. I thought about to be a doctor. So I told my dad, uh -huh. I thought about to be a doctor. My dad told me, to be an artist, you know, is a good thing too. I say, yeah, it was like during that time, I just felt like my eyes is like really hoping to understand, yeah, to be an artist is not a bad thing, you know. So. I asked my dad to send me that school, you know, Academy de Boza, you've mm -hmm. been already there. So I went to the middle school where I'm going to understand much better about uh, art. Wonderful. I did an exhibition there. Oh, <laughs> that's good. The campus is so beautiful. There's sculpture everywhere at your art school. Yeah, thank it's, you. It's wonderful. Um, and it's also, it's so incredible that you had a parent that having done something he didn't want to do, something that, you know, under mm -hmm. colonial rules uh, was determined for him that he couldn't do, that he took that and gifted to his children this idea that yeah. you should do what you're passionate about. That's really an incredible blessing for you to have had the support of your dad. He knew that you had this, you know, this restlessness talent, around yeah. art and this mm -hmm. talent for it. And he said, no, don't, you don't have to be practical. You can just do what you actually love and what gifts you've been given you ought to be um, exercising. Um, so that's, that's wonderful. So in your practice as an artist, uh, you not only reference visual expressions found among various groups of people in the Congo, where you're from, mm -hmm. but you also draw inspiration from the aesthetic traditions of the Baole of Cote d'Ivoire and the Edo people of Benin, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. What aspects of Baole and Benin visual culture most appeal to you, and how do you apply those elements in your art? Well, uh, that's a great question because, you know, living in a country where we have uh, over 450 something tribes, you know, it's if you know a spy from them, I, I think uh, something wrong with you. So, uh, so uh, first of all, before to, to, to respond to those questions, I will not, I mean, this question, I would like to talk about something really. Uh, I think it's really deep for me, it's really important for me. Please. So uh, to be exposing a, a, um, a city like a Kinshasa, especially you already been there and then the farm also been there already, so where you'll find a lot of people, different cultures, you know, they are like embraced, they are together and they, they do, you, you cannot really tell where this uh, person from, where this person exactly is from that tribe, you know, but sometimes we can identify by with accents, like the same way you guys can understand, like, I'm not from here, so just with my accent, the same way, like in Kinshasa, 
we live together, but we have diversity of a culture also, uh, tribes. So, so uh, that thing really gave me an idea to explore more about uh, different tribes in my practice. So it's gonna be like that, more like at my school, we had more time, we had more time to think or to, to learn about like a different tribes, like from Africa, and also from, uh, I'm gonna talk about the Western art too in the same time, but it wasn't really deep. For me, it was one of the things I decided, I made in my life, I said, okay, um, I wanna move, I wanna really more focus on about all these things, and then to bring that, talking about it, because you know, we are in the time where I think we have to write our own story. So because reading all these books, since I've been here in America, I saw so many like on uh, the books, like uh, uh, I can say words, like a uh, uh, Bakongo words is like a more spell it more, you know, it's not really right well. Mm -hmm. And the way they spend some things, some, some, um, so many things in, I mean, in the books, I see it is not really right because when I just like a uh, stop my, um, after I finished like I graduated from like a high school when I, before I went to like a college. Um, so it was a time where I started to try and understand much better about my own identity. So I went to different villages, go understand much better about so many things. So I was like, I started to compare between uh, things I see in like in the book and then things uh, I just uh, hate from that, you know, like a villages or maybe I can say tribes is now really matching. So for me, I was like, okay, I think it's a right now time for us, like uh, African, to s start talking about ourselves, you know, to take about, uh, to take to, to be in the point who we can, we can be able to explain better about so many things. We don't have to let people just let, okay, because you cannot pronounce my name, I'll let you just, you know, to do it the way you want, to pronounce that the way you want, you know. So we, we are now in the time, I think we have to try to correct our own story. So, yeah, I think that's brilliant. And to your point about going yeah. to different villages, mm -hmm. I think we also need to give ourselves the opportunity, especially those of us who consider ourselves scholars or are perceived to have any kind of authority on these matters, we have to go and bear witness, mm -hmm. right? It's not enough to read the books that were written before us, um, especially considering uh, the fraught history of Africa and colonialism. Um, you said, as you said, there's so many things that are incorrect. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways to restore that um, as, the, as a more passive participant, you're talking about Africans speaking for themselves, but I think those who are interested in Africa, um, what they can do is, uh, is make sure that they're questioning the things they read and that they put themselves in positions where they can get a narrative that is directly from the people that they're trying, they're claiming that they're trying to understand. So I think there's a there's a physical story around that where you put you leave mm -hmm. your exactly. your language your land your understanding your culture and you go to the people you're trying to understand. We have, you know, uh, many of us are privileged enough to have the ability to travel. We have planes, we have trains, we have you know boats, mm -hmm. and to go and see people and ask them uh, to verify the things that you've learned. Um, and have that 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 trouble like this this thing that I, I'm seeing this thing I'm observing this thing I'm hearing from the local people is in direct contradiction to many of the things that I assume because of my training elsewhere. But of course it is because it's being filtered through the biases that we all have of our respective cultures. So yeah. point well taken. And and it's interesting that you're you're doing that work across like you know sort of trans African. Um, across different groups of people in Africa, especially in West and Central Africa, and then that is manifested in your work, like that it's a representative of, your work is representative of your travels, your exposure, your attempts to, to understand in a way that's culturally sensitive and mm. thoughtful, all mm. of the diverse groups that you come into contact with. Yeah, that's sure as so well. It's like uh, the same way I start to explore more about uh, like a Baule people and also a Don people, I just understand the differences between them and the Kuba people in the same time, like Kuba tribe from Congo, and to try to make a, all these differences, they are so distinct and at whole. You know, it's like a, when you go to like a Edo people, they usually work with bronze, and the way they just work on the details, and they try to uh, refine it 
to do like their refinement is really different than the Cuba people who the most of the time they working on the wood. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all those things I try to bring together in my style and to try to represent that. The way I'm cutting all these my metals is if you look at that well you're gonna see different um, forms also characters from like African expression, facial also expression, um I can say um shapes body too so i'm trying to represent yeah. all those things it's really interesting to look mm -hmm. at a work of art that you've created and see all these different references yeah um i'm going to continue on this thread and sort of broaden it a little bit um but speaking of hybridity to your own artist statements as you write them you speak uh specifically of syncretizing western contemporary art uh, with African design tradition, mm -hmm. which again is an amalgam of African design traditions in, the, in your case. Mm -hmm. um, and artists in Africa have done this for generations, uh, of course, in the late colonial and early post-colonial period, for example, Nigerian artist and philosopher Uche Okeke termed this approach natural synthesis, mm -hmm. defining it as combining, as you, as you discuss, uh, local visual languages and traditions with select foreign artistic sensibilities to produce an interplay of styles which reclaim indigenous artistic values without discarding Western influence. Um, why do you find this method of intentionally and simultaneously referencing the Western art uh, modalities and those indigenous to Western Central Africa to be the most appropriate approach for you and your own artistic voice? Because again, this is something that you you want to make sure audiences understand in your artist statements. Mm -hmm. You talk a lot about this West, Western and African sort of hybridity. Um, why does that speak to you um, as, as an artist? Well, um, first of all, I agree with uh, what uh, the doctor philosopher mm -hmm. uh, Uche talking about too. Um, um, talking about the syncretism, uh, for me, it, uh, um, we live in a world right now we cannot talk about just yourself. You're, all of us, we are like, uh, I feel we are so uh, influenced about something different, you know, from another culture. I'm going to give an example when we go more deep, look at about like a Cuba tribe, or maybe I can say Cuba people. You will see they have also influence from Western, like Europe, they have like a cross. You know, it's like they take us like a power, like an energy, they include that to their artwork too. So today, I think we have to look at ourselves, you know, like, uh, it's like a different, like a, where, how I can explain that. We have to look at ourselves like, a, uh, I, I think we have to look at ourselves like a diversity. You know, don't look at someone's like a race, it's like a, you know, it's like a some, some, some things like different. But if you, we have a, that's look, I mean, like look at themselves like a diversity that they are passed to, to, to be in the print. Like I'm feel, for example, like, like me, I'm, um, I'm feel like I'm a, um, I'm um, already suffer globalization. So, so how you can say no to other culture because it's different than your culture. So I think it's like a, to learn about anatomic, you know, the, like a Western way. Mm -hmm. It's helping me today to do what I'm doing in the same time too because I went to school. You, you, you know, like talking about like a program in Congo, the 99% of this program, art program is talking, I mean, it's like Western, mm -hmm. to be honest, it's really, Western. Yeah. So they teach maybe like one semester, they're talking about African art for that. Fast usually when we just like uh, graduated from college or maybe from high school, we decide to go out, you know, after school because we want to learn more about ourselves. So I think to be in a position where we don't look at ourselves like different, we look at uh, uh, other people. I mean, we're staying like a, uh, like a diversity, like a, we can also learn something from them to be inspired for them too. It's uh, something help ourselves, like our contemporary artists, to take that energy, to look at someone like her energy is like also, uh, I feel like it's, it's also like a, a way we have to look at as like a humanity. You know, we cannot be just in the box talking about African right. style, African heritage, African, all that things. We have to look at what's going on in the world, you know. Today, right. like in the, you, you know, in the United States, especially, I know you guys, 
uh, supporting like a Palestine and stuff like that. And then I see some people today also start to talk about a little bit about the Congo, free Congo. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering if Palestine was in peace with Israel. I'm just wondering if really people are going to protest for Congo. You know, it's some question we have sometimes also to wonder ourselves too. So for that, I say, if we start just to look at ourselves like diversity, that's going to change the world. Yeah. In a way, this, this idea about, um, just to go back to um, natural synthesis and this idea of being thoughtful about um, sort of taking pieces of uh, Western uh, art tradition, Western ideas about beauty and practice, and combining it with indigenous ways of, 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 of seeing. Um, it, it's almost obvious, right? Like we are, in a, mm -hmm. as you said, a globalized world. Like yeah. Of course, it's a, we're hybrids, right? We are, and, and first of all, culture is not static. It's always changing. Who we think we are evolves over time as we encounter other things. As you said, we absorb them. You were talking about those, the, the crosses that many groups in, uh, in Congo have, a, acquired and attributed a different meaning to, mm -hmm. but they came across the crucifix through the Portuguese and then they gave it its own meaning. Exactly. So now it is a part yeah. of their culture. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the meaning it had when it came. So um, I think those kinds of things are really interesting and, um, and in a way m suggest that perhaps uh, hybridity is just more honest about who we really are. We are not existing in silos. Um, aside from what we witness on the news, in our everyday lives we're encountering people that leave these marks on us and change um, how we see ourselves and how we see the world. So uh, we spoke before, you and I, uh, briefly about how your original plan when you were thinking about migrating to the United States was actually to live in New York. Um, so I, I'm going to speak about Atlanta a little bit because you found your way here. Um, your uncle, uh, as you told me when we spoke before, uh, was a doctor, is a doctor, um, but at the time he was based in New York. Um, and he was very supportive of your art, like your father, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and offered you the opportunity to live with him while pursuing your art career because he was, you know, sort of campaigning for the relevance of New York, especially in the art market. Um, but then he was recruited by the CDC, mm -hmm. which of course is headquartered here in Atlanta. So you ended up here completely unplanned. Now that you're here and you've been here a few years, what do you think of Atlanta? How do you find it? And what does Atlanta as far as you can tell in the few years you've been here, what does Atlanta have to offer artists that other perhaps more commercially viable markets do not? What does Atlanta have that, that New York doesn't? And how are you finding your time here? Well, that's a complex question too in the same time. You know, uh, our festival, I'm gonna talk about the vibe, you know. So I smell like uh, five years in Atlanta uh, we found to be connected with anyone, you know, it was like an artist. I was like a, wondering myself how I'm going to, you know, get in the gallery. See, I'm going to do it because I lost all my pictures. My work I used to made in Congo. Uh, how did you lose your art? I mean, I used to have like a pictures, you know, before just to come here, my uncle told me, so you don't have the money to get all, all your artworks, you know, it's like a special, like living in New York is so expensive. People live in like, a, people sometimes live in like a closet. So I did wonder him like, what is closet? He told me, come here, you're gonna be inspired, you're gonna understand much better why it's closet. <laughs> so when he just moved here in Atlanta, and then when it came, I mean, when it, I, said, I was like, I don't wanna be in New York, you know? Man, I don't wanna, I don't wanna go to Atlanta because I don't know much about Atlanta. So I'm gonna start to research about Atlanta, understand if they really have a market, stuff like that. Because during that time, I had like some of my friends, they started already to go up, you know, in the market in France, Belgium, London. So I was like, okay, they are doing good, you know, because I know their artwork, it was like, uh, let's say maybe one, no 1,000, it was maybe 200, stuff like that. And then once they just get in the markets like a France, and the London is just already like a 10,000 stuff like that. It was like, okay, I think we have my Linton's oil or my stuff. I know I'm really good. You know, then them, yeah, I cannot compare myself with them, but I'm also really good. I think that's gonna work too, you know, but it wasn't the case. And then um, be in Atlanta, uh, to be more specific to your question. So be in Atlanta is, uh, uh, 
I can see it's a blessed moment for myself, for my life, especially uh, it's not about selling first. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about to grow, it's about to engagement into the community. It's something people really don't understand, you know. Uh, it was like when uh, one of my, it's like my big brother, brother in the same time, like uh, Victor, he, he told me about you, about uh, Famo especially too. So I got a good friend that if you never met with Famo, I said, no, yeah. <laughs> but it's gonna, gonna have a time to marry them. So living with my uncle, especially in Atlanta where he moved to here, he had like a big house with eight rooms. Oh, wow. You know? You didn't have that in New York? No, I didn't. I mean, he told me, man, you can't work in the garage, and then you have uh, more rooms, because it, during that time, we used to live like just three people at home. Wow. So he told me, uh, you don't have to pay anything. So because you have to learn about the language, try to connect with people, because I don't know nothing about art here. So you guys because I, I, my, 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 my little brother used to live here with me too, it's like my cousin, you know, we don't have a word cousin, we say just brother. Yeah, so uh, we used to live together like in you in Atlanta, and then uh, I started to work in the garage. I worked to the warehouse, uh, like a welder, because I had already had skills before I came here, and it's gonna be like that, I started to save my money, buy my first car, Toyota Sienna, <laughs> and then I start to save money because I had a plan to get back an art. So it took me like a three years saving money. Uh, and then my uncle moved in, back in Congo working for CDC there. And then I said, okay, that's the time for me to do art. It was 2020. I started already working like from his garage and then I had my own apartment working in, you know, it's like my apartment with my brother helped me sometimes and do different things in my, inside my apartment. And it's gonna be like that. My first show I did, in, I mean, it was in Atlanta. I applied for art fields. Mm -hmm. So I was select, my first, I did my installation there and they're gonna be like that. I met pretty good artists, you know, from Atlanta, like William Massey, he work usually mm -hmm. like a public artist, one of my good friends who was like, I don't want you to do what you do. Um, go to a warehouse is good, but you're a good artist, so. You have to sometimes, if I have like opportunity, you can come work with me because you're so talented. I encourage you. And then I met Jonathan Mefador too. Mm -hmm. So they tell me, man, you have to come work with us sometimes. If you have opportunity, you're going to be the first person. We're going to start to call you to come help us. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's a testament to Atlanta that in three years you were able to. You know, you came here, you didn't know anybody. I didn't know everybody. With the help of your uncle, and that's pretty much it. You were able to, because of the way that this community functions, you were able to work hard, you know, meet yeah. a lot of people, start to collaborate, have Warm. gallery shows. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in a place like New York, arguably, it would take no. you much longer than three years. Much longer. First, yeah. first of all, another thing also, especially in Atlanta here, uh, I know Atlanta people, they, all people, they feel like they are star. you know, like they're, they're so proud of themselves. It's yeah. something I really love it. You know, when you go to like on the show exhibition, you feel everyone's like so fancy. They, they don't have any complex of fear really about uh, you from New York, you from anywhere, you know, in the world. They don't care. They see just like you're like a human being. So it's going to be Atlanta helped me see like a family, see all like a Michi Miko, people I talk really sometimes, you know, ask them questions. Uh, I got so many artists I talk with them and they really encourage me. I look at my way like, okay, uh, I think in America, uh, especially artists in Atlanta, they have a mindset to be more independent. They don't want to depend into the gallery because into the gallery you can get bigger but they do things by themselves. They have a different program here. They try to do move, you know, in a different area, in a different way. So it was so inspiring for me. It's like I was so inspired to see myself. I say, okay, I can do things. I can do, I can be so independent. I yeah. think it's much better than to go to New York, start my career there. Yeah. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. The, um my experience here is that combination that you just spoke of, that people are entrepreneurial in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. They're not looking to True. get into the gates necessarily. Um, they're really interested in building their own. Um, and then while they're entrepreneurial, they're not individualistic. 
I find yeah, that almost true. anyone will take a meeting with you, take you under their wing, as you said, William did, and Jonathan, and Michi, and Fahamu. Um, if, you, if you are interested in, um, in, in making and in contributing, uh, people will give you their time. And that accessibility is very special. And not, I don't think I've experienced the accessibility of people and opportunities sure. in, uh, the way that I have in Atlanta and any other place I've lived. Um, Okay, last question before we take questions from the audience. I hope you guys have a lot of questions. I hope you're chomping at the bit, ready to raise your hands. Okay, I see some head nods. Great. Let me get let me through give me get through this question fast then. Okay. Um, so uh, many of our mutual friends, uh, you and I, in, mm -hmm. in Congo and in Africa in contemporary art, they there's this pattern where they all almost all of them have bigger visions than their own art careers. Uh, they've launched art collectives and art nonprofits, for example, to help fortify the arts ecosystems uh, where they are and to ensure support for emerging artists in their hometowns and elsewhere. What are your visions and projects for the future? I'm sure you've imagined them, especially after spending time in Atlanta with all these entrepreneurial people. Yeah, so. Um You know, like a white garden there. So I think they want to more help than Kinshasa. Because in Kinshasa, you're going to find people have already felt. They have like a chorus, they have a, everything. They figure out how to do things. You know, they know how to recycle things. Also, they have a much of an awareness of the world. But in Ghana, it's not really, we don't know how to do it. You know, we, we think we know how to do it. And a lot of people that don't know how to talk to them are kind of lose powers. You know, they don't talk to them. They don't know how to talk And then you think your problem is like bigger than some people they just like are trying to escape, you know, but that civil war they really want to leave. They don't want to start the problem and start the problem situation. So they don't really want to be here, they don't want to have a badge, they don't want to have a business, but they want to just stay and work. You know, 
questions, right? So I would like to, you know, give people experiences that would change their mind, you know, maybe to work with people who feel So raise your hands if you have a question. When I met you, <laughs> and I um, met you at the Academy of Arts and Science in New York City. Yeah, and it was in 
of African struggle, maybe common struggle. They say usually uh, um, human beings are like a... I have a request. <laughs> Can you say it in your language and then yeah. say it in English? In French? Yeah. Or in French. <laughs> Which, whichever way the proverb is said. Le, you le, said le, there's le, a proverb. Le, <laughs> les êtres humains sont comme de parasoleil et ils sont plus sous leur camp en, quand ils sont comme des parasols, c'est plus, ils sont plus, non, I mean, les êtres humains sont comme des parasols et ils sont euh, au leur camp, I mean, come on, how can you explain that? <laughs> in French too. No, let me go, go back in English, it's much better. Okay. So, human being is like an umbrella, you know, it's really helping just for you, you know, it's also helping that. So, it's like a, the mind is like, uh, okay, try, let me try, try to explain that. To go just like in, in this explanation, so it's like a human human being. It's a uh, in human being is a, a he understands stuff much better when it's like a struggle, you know, it's like in around like a situation or maybe condition. Mm -hmm. So I wanna just talk about one thing, you know, you should never ever go out of your comfort zone, or maybe you never been outside where you burn and then rain. You cannot understand much better about the world. Mm -hmm. You cannot talk, talk to me much better about Africa if you never been in Africa. Right. Reading a book of Africa and then you never experience Africa, you cannot talk about it. You know, being in the United States, I think living here is like over five years. You never been influenced by them. I'm still realize when I talk with my mom and then I like if I talk, you know, when we, we speak like in Lingala. I said, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, but what can you do? And then I said that. We have some things where it's like a really natural, it's not like you copy or maybe you try to 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 do like everybody do, you have to use cars, to use all that things, but just because you're merged in the culture, because you want to learn something, you want to experience something, and then you just uh, feel like a fish in the world. You know, so I feel the most of the time when we are sometimes influenced by something, it's not because we plan to have that. Sometimes it's because we live in that culture and then we just embrace it for that things. So I feel like that's the most of the time in my work. So if you don't find yourself in it, because you think like I'm talking about the African story, it doesn't make sense. I want to say one thing. It's like from one of the philosophers from Seneca. He say usually he's a professor in New York City too. His name is Bachelor. He say usually African problem is uh, glo global problem. In the same way, European or American problem is also African problem. So you cannot separate all these countries or maybe all this world because it's already a globe. You cannot separate that. So the policy. So if something is happening in like a Palestine, we are concerned too. You know, like a, today we're talking about immigration. You know what's happening right now, and we talk about like a, um, I'm gonna be. I wanna try to be more specific. Let's talk about like a Palestine. Why do you even feel more involved in this problem? Because you know, in another way, it's gonna come back to, to us. You know, talking about immigration. How many people from Russia, from all this, not Russia, like Congo, from all this country have like a problem now they try to migrate in the United States? I know some Congolese, they go like Angola. From Angola, they take like a plane to Brazil. To Brazil, they start to get like all these countries to Mexico, and then they try to get in America. So if America don't try to let Congo, for example, free, so you're gonna receive all these people from all these different countries to come here because they see you doing good, you are fine. Okay, let us to be there because they wanna get all these resources. They don't wanna have to organize themselves. So let us to live there because they think they have a monopoly. They have like they they can control or they can like I have to say they can organize everything for us. Let us to be lead by them to in the side of their country. Right, right. we're interconnected in Chicken community. Yes. Yes. Any more questions? Please, please. 
Uh, this wasn't really a question because you guys pretty much covered a great landscape of um, information, but I just wanted to big you up, um, you know, because I met you early when you came to Atlanta. I see you at a show. You were very uh, withdrawn being new to Atlanta, and I think we had a conversation, and I gave you a tiny bit of advice. Yeah. And to see you now, you know what I'm saying, is 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 a moment. Not that I'm taking credit for that at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But you know what we talk, we know what I'm talking about. I know, I know. And it's, 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 you know what I'm saying? And it's, it's just great to see you moving and shaking and embedded in this art community. Um, you know, because I was there not too long before you was doing the same thing. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's great to see, you know what I'm saying? Because it's a testament that if you want it and if you're hungry enough, you can get it, period. Thank you very much. That's one of the artists also we talk a lot. So we spend time together sometimes like a Friday, Saturday, we are together and then talk about so many things. That's amazing. This is your community. Yeah, this is my community. I love Atlanta. I think it's like my second house. <laughs> yeah. Mrs. Sunday. Yes. Um, Lauren, you actually spoke to it earlier, but just how special Atlanta is because I think the first time we saw your artwork was at Art Field in South Carolina. But there were all of these Atlanta people that we also connected with while we were there, including you. And so I guess just how even in your travels and exploration, I don't know how you ended up at Artfield or how you applied to Artfield, but just how interconnected Atlanta's art community is even outside of the city. And just speaking to that a little bit. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> Well, what, what exactly is it, is it? Is it just how Atlanta's interconnected in? Even outside of Atlanta, mm -hmm. right? Like we could go to a place like Lake City, South Carolina, mm -hmm. that's four hours away, the size of Maybury, right? And that there's all of these Atlanta artists and all of this Atlanta artistry that we're introduced to outside the city of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Like we hadn't seen your work before, we weren't familiar with your work. True. And so just, I guess speaking to those opportunities that you've had outside of Atlanta that have made you even more connected to Atlanta. That's true. You know, um, Atlanta have a different community in some time too. Like I said, it was connecting to like a big time about South, uh, South uh, River. Stephen, you know, back away. I started just playing there and then people that I know just came out to Atlanta. You know, different uh, community, but I think um, is, one another proverb African say when you have you are cold, you have to go to the fire. It's not the fire. The fire is not, cannot come to you. So when you like a cold, go to the fire. So it's like one of the things I did, I went to the I start I just decided like on with my phone, I say okay, let me start to find like a different shows in Atlanta and then go see you know, just like a supporting all the artists. It's gonna be like that the one I uh, I make like up up time too, you know. I went to a show, so a show. I went to different artists here, like show me a topic. Then you know, just like hey, to introduce myself, like myself. I ended up they was really cool with me, and then they said, you know, if you have a time, you can stop by my studio. It was like that. I start, you know, to build this relationship with all, uh, especially like in Atlanta. And was it through your Atlanta relationships that you ended up in these other places, in South Carolina, etc.? Yeah, I can say some of them is like that too, but some of them is it's like my first show I, I, I had in 2021, I just discovered that on my, like our field, it was by myself. And then in our fields, I met William Smarcy, John, I mean, he told me about Johnny Hay, and then he talked about all of these other artists about me. And then it's gonna be like that when I came, I understand I have to go to people, I don't have to wait for people to come to me. So I start to go to different places like galleries, and then I met people, and then people talk about me, about other people. So they start to invite me, it was like that, that I start to establish myself, it's, in it's Atlanta, especially in Atlanta. It's interesting how sometimes we have to go away to find home. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It happened, this happens to me a lot, uh, in fact, you know, um, I, can't, I have so many stories about people that were in Atlanta, or at, or at least in on the East Coast, in the art community that I didn't know mm -hmm. until I was in Africa, and then I met this guy. It's like, it's hilarious. Like, I had to come all the way up here and meet someone who lives up the street. But that's happened to me so many times. Um, so, yeah, it's unsurprising to hear that you go 
like to South Carolina and then you see all these people from Atlanta yeah. that end up becoming a, a big part of your community mm -hmm. and your development as an artist too. Mm -hmm. Is that it for our questions today? One more? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Col color represents already diversity, you know. Uh, I think you, you will see like a, I didn't make the decision to use all these clothes throughout the week, but you know, the most of clothes throughout the high right now. I mean, I have right now is like a blue, you know. Um, but right now, I have, I have, I have some school jerseys like a, uh, 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 Right. I mean, it's not usually I don't make the decision. I don't make a decision about the color. Sometimes, I feel like uh, some colors can be spontaneous. You know, it's not something you really plan, and it's just about emotion stuff and also like experience. Like you may be sometimes you, especially when you are spiritual man. To be spiritual, you know, you have to be a guru. You know, you gotta be some someone who's like a do a. <laughs> to be spiritual, like to be just connect with your soul, mm -hmm. and then it's like that. Sometimes, you know, we can just originate this from this indigenous spirit. And that's my way to this color is not something I really plan, or maybe I really try to to be more specific about it. It's the inspiration that I feel like comes from the spirit. So you use the speaking color. Yes, exactly. <laughs> also, like a school values. I know that people don't love. You know, keep it, you know, and keep it just like that. <laughs> uh, and then one day we had like a studio moment, you know, like a make a sculpture, it's like a school that was in high school. And then uh, I was doing like my portrait, something like that. And then I had the idea to use screwdriver, to make art with screwdriver. And I told the rest of my friends, because I told them, hey guys, look at what I made with the screwdrivers. So if you can, I know you, all of you guys, you have like a something also for your protection. So if you can use all these things to change our community, to tell people we need more love, we, we can protect ourselves with love. We don't need all that things. It's like a few that people use also, you know, like a gun, things like that. If we can take it, bring it together, make art with that, it's gonna change so many things. So it's gonna be like that. I started to transform school driver when I came in and I said it's one of my friends who's working with story told me I got school drivers here. So because he knew about my story and then he said, okay, give me just like, you know, fifty dollars for thousand school drivers. So it was like two thousand school drivers, something like that. And yeah, it was like that I started to develop that to share this story, especially like in Atlanta here. And then in some time, I say, okay, I can use it, you know, because it makes sense to talk about all this, my experience, like you may be, or maybe I come with this, but in some time, to put it together, together like a hair, it come from another practice uh, by Congo people use. You know, usually it's like in a kissy. You will see they use a, a, a piece of metal, and they put it like in a kissy. You know, usually it's like about, uh, 
Okay, it was like uh, um, uh, in surrogate and case you talk about different things to punish someone is about the justice in the same way I try to commit school drivers as my mask telling people if you can be real if I'm self and then to try to connect uh, all these school drivers together to stop all this war we got in the world if we can do all that things to make it like Kisi to punish all these people because we don't want to fight we want to share love let's make a mask let's make something we can share in the community because you know the more in Africa mask wasn't created to be in the white world you know the mask wasn't created to be in the museum cover with all these I'm not against you guys <laughs> you know to cover mask the way you protect that but it was created for exhibition to exhibit with that to wear that so that I invite all of you also in September here we're gonna have a, a performance of with a mask so dancing with a mask we're gonna have explain something like that here too where I'm gonna you know to get in concept of uh, just have an artwork in the wall so to give people also access to touch to wear the mask that's gonna be another project maybe this year to have an exhibition where we can have like a 100 mask so all of single person gonna come in the show can wear a mask Now the performance is gonna be here before that one, so I, I want a mic. Yeah, to be honest, I got I got maybe right now like uh, ten thousand school drivers already from people, you know. So uh, for that I love Atlanta. Okay, <laughs> someone just so so some, someone just say, hey, I saw school drivers here. It's like over oh, maybe ten ten you know ten thousand school drivers. Do you are you, are you do you want to buy it? I say yeah, I'm gonna talk with them. So how much? It's like, gonna be like a thousand but I won't be able to just to tell me hey if you have a 100 you can have all these school drivers so it's possible to have experience a social where you work everybody gonna come everyone gonna come in the show to have a mask and then enjoying the moment we can perform all of us we look mm -hmm. forward to the screwdriver mask in the air <laughs> is that it for us yes yes thank you thank you y'all Thank you to Lauren Tate Baeza. She's the Fred and Rita Richmond Curator of African Art at the High Museum, and to Marcela and Cola. Wait, mm, Cola. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, uh, y'all uh, make some noise, please. <laughs> yes, beautiful audience. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, so, you know, now I gotta put my preacher hat on and pass the plate around. Uh, because if you enjoy programs like this, your support uh, to Adama means that we can continue to bring you guys these type of conversations, um, our exhibitions, and other types of programming to engage the African diaspora in contemporary art here in Atlanta. And so around you right now, you'll see some little flyers like this. If you have it around you on the back, there's a little QR code where you can scan and uh, make a donation to Adama. Uh, and if you're watching us online, you can also uh, find the link in the chat, I'm sure, to uh, make a donation online. Uh, I also have a couple of announcements real quick. As you can see when, we're, when you were walking in, we're mounting our next exhibition, which is called The Perfect Gift. Uh, this exhibition is a photographic narrative of living and deceased organ donors and transplant recipients, uh, which is designed to empower and educate and increase organ, eye, and tissue donation in the African-American community. So, Many of us don't realize that, you know, for African Americans, when we go in and we need to have uh, an organ transplant, it's very, very difficult oftentimes because there aren't enough organ donors from the African American community. And so this exhibition is designed to raise awareness around that need and that gap. Uh, it features the work of a photographer named Johnny Crawford, who has uh, done portraits of several people who have uh, been uh, recipients of organ, of, of donated organs. Um, and so that exhibition will open tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening, and will be up until May 3rd. So we hope you will come back and join us for the opening uh, of the exhibition. And our next uh, Adama Salon will be a virtual salon on Sunday, April 28th, uh, featuring Mabula Sumahoro in conversation with Atu Ribeiro and Derek Boateng. So please make sure you register online for the next Adama Salon. 
and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you guys for being here um, and for your continued support of the family. Thank you again.